So I'd like to introduce uh, DDG Everard. Uh, she is a, has led the International Atomic Energy Agency Department of Nuclear Safety and Security since April 2021. Prior to her current position, she served as a commissioner of the French Nuclear Safety Authority and also served in roles in France's Ministry of the Environment and Ministry of Economy and Finance. Her broad experience includes oversight of research and environmental issues, regulation of waste, decommissioning of fuel cycle facilities, management of radioactive materials, and responsibilities for radiation protection and nuclear safety. At the IAEA, she oversees more than 450 staff and coordination of all aspects of IAEA's safety and security mission. Chair, the floor is yours. Thanks, John. And thank you, Deputy Director General Everard Liddy, uh, for being here and joining us here at the RIC. It really has been an absolute pleasure for me personally uh, to work with you for the past three years. And three years that have included a lot of challenges and some pretty big successes. You know, one success I think I just want to highlight up front and that I really wanted to thank you for was all the support on the part of the agency, uh, along with my uh, good friend, uh, Christopher Victorson from the United Arab Emirates to host the regulatory, uh, the, the, um, regulatory Effectiveness Conference in the UAE last year. I think that was a great success. And one of the things I appreciate too is the support of the agency in following up from that conference, not just having it be a collection of documents that sits on a shelf somewhere, but actually build, building momentum for the next conference in three years. Um, we'll get to this in a minute too, but also just recognizing and really appreciating all of the work that the agency has done and particularly your group in, uh, in supporting uh, Ukraine as well as initiatives to um, harmonize and synergize uh, regulatory approaches um, for new reactors really across the globe. So before I really dive into the substance, I wanted to give you a, a couple minutes to make any remarks you'd like to make. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, dear Chair Hansen, dear Chris. So it's my great pleasure to be here and thank you very much for this uh, invitation. Before starting, I would like to say a few words about uh, the U.S. NRC, and uh, more specifically, a big uh, thank you to the U.S. Uh, NRC and to you uh, in particular for the great support we receive, you know, continuously uh, from the U.S. NRC directly uh, through the participation of many uh, uh, NRC staff in our activities, or indirectly through the support you provide uh, to our activities, in particular for capacity building activities. Thank you very much for this. Uh, it's uh, very much appreciated and uh, we have uh, conducted many activities together. You just mentioned the regulatory conference in Abu Dhabi, but uh, there are many others uh, in uh, a wide uh, range of uh, areas. Uh, so nuclear safety, of course, uh, radiation safety, nuclear security. I think this is a, a huge topic for the agency. So I uh, would like to uh, highlight uh, how much we appreciate your support Thank you so much, and uh, I would like to echo some of uh, your uh, comments uh, this morning regarding this uh, so changing landscape. I think this is a big challenge for uh, everyone, and the fact that uh, we can work together. It's uh, referring to what you mentioned regarding uh, optimism. It's a force a multiplier. I think international cooperation is uh, a force multiplier in this regard as well, so, and I think the US NRC plays a great role for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, let's dive in, shall we? You've traveled to Ukraine quite a lot in the last uh, two years with your most recent trip with um, Director General Grossi, I think a little over um, a month ago. Could you just give us an update in your perspectives on the status of operational safety and security at Zaporizhia, um, maybe even including your views about um, the impact of the, I think there was a recent announcement um, that none of the staff employed by Ukraine's national operator, Energo Adam, would be allowed to remain working at the site, et cetera. Can, you, can we just uh, hear from you a little bit about what you've learned and what you're seeing there? So, uh, Zaporizhia. First of all, today uh, we completed the 17th rotation at Zaporizhia. So, the 17th uh, 
uh, team uh, arrived uh, today at Zaporizhia safely. So I think this is uh, something I wanted to uh, mention because this is, we have built, in fact, our knowledge at Zaporizhia for the last uh, 18 months, more than 18 months now. And uh, these uh, rotations uh, bring uh, a lot of uh, knowledge to the agency and uh, I would like to echo uh, to what uh, the Commissioner uh, Caputo uh, mentioned, uh, this kind of knowledge, you know, uh, management. This is really key, you know, in this kind of uh, situation because we started with no, almost no knowledge uh, or very, uh, let's say, a general knowledge at Zaporizhia. We uh, conducted some uh, OSAT missions uh, in, at Zaporizhia before the war started. But of course, everything uh, has changed uh, since uh, February and March the 3rd of March 2022, and uh, we had to uh, reconsider the framework of our assessment for safety and security. This is completely different from any situation we can you know, experience uh, in any other member states, whatever the nature of um, the facility or the, the situation uh, in uh, any other member state. So at Zaporizhia, we started from scratch. With these rotations, now after uh, 18 months, we have uh, many uh, teams uh, uh, with these rotations, many uh, experts, some of them uh, participated in uh, up to three missions at Zaporizhia. Uh, at Zaporizhia. So each mission is uh, one month, so that means uh, they have now uh, and sometimes even uh, more than one month. But uh, So we have gained uh, good knowledge, but having said that, it, uh, there is a big challenge is how to assess safety and security in, at a nuclear power plant in a war zone. So that means that we have to reconsider some basic you know, principles, and uh, that's uh, where we came uh, to these uh, seven indispensable pillars, which um, are the most important uh, topics uh, which derive from our international safety standards, but uh, applied to a war uh, situation. And as of today, I would say that uh, the situation is uh, very precarious. Uh, there is no nuclear power plant you know, designed to uh, operate or even to, uh, to be in a war zone. So this is uh, just uh, starting with a very basic you know, uh, a reminder that no, uh, there is no nuclear power plant you know, aimed at being uh, you know, located in a war zone. That means that we have to pay attention to uh, all these uh, potential uh, hazards or so external hazards, uh, shelling, uh, loss of uh, off-site uh, power supply, loss of um, water supply, so with uh, the destruction of the Kakovka Dam. So, you know, I would say we are monitoring the situation. It's really precarious with this uh, recent development with the staff uh, now uh, that uh, has been uh, requested to sign uh, contracts with uh, and all of them. So this is not completely new, but uh, since uh, the 1st of February 2024, now all staff at Zaporizhia uh, needs to have uh, their uh, job contract with uh, the company, uh, the Russian company. So that, of course, uh, implies a lot of uh, new challenges for safety, because safety relies on technical equipment, of course, but on people. And this is obvious that uh, when you have uh, staff uh, with, uh, under pressure with this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, limitations and, uh, yes, and uh, yes, pressure, I think this is uh, very, very challenging for safety. Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredibly uh, stressful environment, and it is an ongoing tragedy. I think it's, that's important to uh, recognize that uh, we are still in the midst of this, and it's still a very uh, precarious situation, this illegal seizure that uh, Russia has done. But while we're in the midst of this, is it, is it time yet to draw any conclusions or to step back and look at this and things that we can learn and put in place more broadly for uh, ensuring the safe and secure operation of nuclear power plants in conflict zones? So it's very um, premature to uh, be able to have uh, conclusions, but you're right. I think we uh, need to, let's say, uh, not to uh, forget what we have learned over the last uh, two years. So this is a kind of um, very, very uh, unique situation uh, where the 
situation is not stabilized at all. This is uh, the major difference huh? between an emergency or an accident or, and what we are you know, experiencing in uh, Ukraine. In Ukraine, nothing is predictable. So that means that uh, we, and we have uh, experienced this uh, with the destruction of the Kakovka Dam, with uh, so many uh, events, uh, completely unpredictable. That means that we need to weigh the pros and cons uh, from uh, having this kind of uh, capturing what we have learned from the last two years. So we are preparing a technical document uh, based on uh, what we have learned uh, at Zaporizhia, but at the other nuclear power plants as well, because uh, the other nuclear power plants uh, may have some uh, challenges as well, of course, because of the war. And the, this will be a kind of uh, interim, uh, interim report for us to keep uh, memory and uh, track of what, what we have observed over the last two years that will be an interim report because, of course, we will be able to uh, elaborate more on this lesson learned once the war is over. Not now. I think it's just an interim report. But, however, I think that will be uh, helpful for us uh, to have uh, this kind of uh, first um, reflection of uh, how we could you know, strengthen nuclear safety and security in this kind of uh, very uh, unprecedented you know, conditions. Good. Well, we we'll look forward to seeing that. Thank you. I want to emphasize, we've talked about Ukraine and, and what's going on there is so important and to raise the awareness um, and to highlight the, the actions of the agency. But your obligations and your work in Ukraine are on top of the core mission, particularly of your organization, of uh, safeguards organization, et cetera. And, and even outside of that Ukraine work, which is substantial, you've seen some challenges and some real successes. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about all of the other things, that, the other uh, uh, um, work that's going on uh, in, in, in your part of the agency. Thank you. I think that's very important to highlight that uh, even if uh, Ukraine uh, has mobilized a lot of resources uh, within the department and within the agency, we uh, still uh, continue to providing you know, support to member states. In particular, uh, we continue, of course, uh, the development of safety standards or nuclear security guidance documents. This is one of our core activities, and we should not stop this, you know. It's a kind of long-term uh, activity that will be very, very, uh, let's say, um, difficult to stop and then to restart. So we, of course, uh, continue, we are continuing this activity. We continue to provide support to member states for, um, for them to apply these standards because it's not enough uh, uh, to have some standards. We need to have them, you know, applied uh, in uh, the different uh, member states. We continue, of course, our capacity building activities, and this is uh, something key because this is really a long-term uh, activities. This is uh, thanks to our activities today that we will make uh, you know, nuclear safety and security stronger in the future. So this is really you know, a long-term uh, uh, activity. So these are our core activities. We uh, had to reorganize some of them, sometimes to reprioritize some uh, uh, steps, but we have uh, kept the same you know, focus on this. In addition to that, we have some uh, very specific initiatives, uh, such as the one on uh, SMRs, so the NESI uh, you know, initiative, so Nuclear Harmonization and Standardization Initiative, uh, aimed at um, providing support to member states and to facilitate the, the deployment of uh, safe and secure SMRs. I would like to highlight a very um, important uh, event um, on um, nuclear security with the uh, inauguration of uh, the new nuclear uh, security training and demonstration center. So the, this new center is uh, located in Cyberstorf, so it's uh, one hour uh, from Vienna, but uh, this is a new training center uh, designed to provide uh, training courses to member states, but in a complementary manner complementary to what uh, member states can find you know, as uh, uh, potential um, courses in the field of nuclear security. And this center is key to me because that will help you know, member states to uh, strengthen their national uh, security framework, and that's very important. Well, you've touched on the, 
nuclear harmonization and standardization initiative, but you kind of, I, 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 I love this, uh, this initiative at CyberStorf around um, nuclear security. So I kind of want to jump in, if I can, a little bit in, into capacity building, because of course, what the agency does, and particularly the capabilities, the, the, the laboratory capabilities and the research and development capabilities at CyberStorf outside of Vienna, um, are, are, are so important. The education and training, the human resource development, et cetera. Can you speak a little bit more about those efforts and share your perspectives about, you know, what are the gaps that you see that your organization is filling? How can member states contribute to help fill those gaps either, either directly or through the agency itself, et cetera? Gaps, I don't know, but for sure, I think we need to have a very, very comprehensive, you know, set of um, activities to be as efficient as possible in capacity building activities. Uh, that means that we need to work on different uh, formats of uh, uh, events, so it could be training courses, e-learning, events, uh, meetings, workshops. So we have a, a lot of uh, many different formats. We need to cover different areas. So uh, from uh, radioactive sources, you know, uh, safety for, for radioactive sources, waste management. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm selecting this kind of uh, topics because these are some very, very, very challenging topics for member, member states, in particular for those who uh, do not uh, have a um, nuclear program. Yes. While, you know, radioactive sources, uh, waste management, I think, uh, of course, or radiation uh, protection uh, in the medical field. Yes. You know, just selecting these uh, kind of areas, which are not as big, I would say, as nuclear safety, but uh, however, that may uh, imply potential, you know, uh, implications uh, on uh, safety and in the public domain, in addition. So that's, uh, so different formats, different, uh, a wide range of activities, and then I think we need to use different levels. So the international level, of course, this is where the agency can provide a very strong support. But regional levels are very, very important because this is something uh, in addition to uh, what we can do at the, the, the international level, and that, that usually it's very efficient to have these uh, two different levels so that you know, member states can have the global picture and at the same time to have some specificities linked to their geographical region and then to implement what is, let's say, the best um, suitable to their needs and I think the, more, uh, the most efficient, of course. This is how we can build this, and that's uh, where you know the U.S. Uh, is uh, so key uh, for us because you provide uh, support at the global level. You participate in many you know activities, uh, conveying very strong messages. At the same time, you support some region, uh, regional you know uh, initiatives, and with the two uh, uh, two types of uh, activities, I think that's very very efficient at the end of the day. Thank you. I, I am really interested in the radioactive waste disposal and handling of that, right? If, if as, as the DG, and I know your organization is supported, if, if we want to expand the peaceful uses of radioactive materials around the world for human health and development, for industry, for uh, economic development and other kinds of things, there is this kind of back end of collecting those sources afterwards. And, and I know as we've both traveled uh, around the world that we, um, the issue of disused sources uh, has, has become an issue, even as we've seen some countries also um, start to collect those, store them safely and securely, uh, et cetera. Which I think is a nice segue into uh, Rays of Hope. And, and it is a, it's a major initiative, for those of you who don't know, on the part of the IAEA to uh, increase access to radiotherapy and nuclear medicine around the world for, uh, for cancer care for underserved populations. It's, a, um, it, it's been a remarkable um, and worthwhile program. It's had a lot of impact since its inception in 2002 with the first wave, um, um, first wave countries. Could you talk a little bit about it? And I think one of the things I'm really interested in in, in uh, 
with Rays of Hope, and the United States is a big supporter, uh, um, for those of you who don't know. We, we've, we've, through the State Department and the USAID and others, contributed substantially to this. But from the regulatory perspective, you know, my interest a little bit, and I, and I suspect yours might be too, is, is making sure that there's some regulatory framework, right? That there's an opportunity for inspection. I think Commissioner Wright saw this a little bit when he was in Ghana, there with the inspector, inspectors at the hospital. He had those great pictures. Um, making sure that there's some regulatory, even just kind of the basics in place for licensing and inspection and so forth. Talk to me about how, you know, what the, say, technical cooperation group or the nuclear applications group in the IAEA are intersecting with what you're doing and how this is kind of coming together. Rise of Hope is a very uh, interesting initiative because uh, it brings together different departments and in a very uh, integrated manner. So it's led, of course, by uh, the Department of Technical Cooper Cooperation together with the Department of Nuclear Science and Applications because of this uh, focus on uh, medical uh, needs. But uh, safety and security uh, experts are involved at the very beginning. So what we have changed with this initiative is now we assess safety and security uh, frameworks at the very, very beginning of the process and not at the end or too late uh, or later in the process because we can identify with this uh, very, very early uh, involvement where you know, member states may need some support for them to fill the gap because it's Nobody wants to deliver, you know, um, medical equipment without uh, the proper uh, safety, you know, um, framework. But we can provide support, and this is where the agency can uh, help. We can, once we have a, a good understanding of what is missing, then we can provide uh, support and assistance so that the member states can, you know, reach the right level for, for, for them to receive the medical, you know, um, this medical equipment. So this is something, yes, uh, rather new, or at least a bit different from what we uh, did before. That means that we uh, have this uh, kind of um, a project management, you know, approach with uh, the, all the departments, you know, uh, working together for uh, a better identification of the needs and then uh, earlier, you know, involvement of the agency so that safety and security are not the true stopper, you know, at some points. But uh, and at the same time, of course, we need to ensure uh, the right level of safety for the benefits of uh, workers, of course, and patients. You know, we cannot deliver uh, this kind of medical equipment without uh, the appropriate uh, framework for safety. But we work earlier in the process so that we can provide support as needed. So this is a new, this is still, you know, in progress, yeah. but this is really the, the philosophy of, the, of the, this initiative together with, uh, well, including safety and security very early in the process. No, I, I, I love that. In a way, the, the regulatory and the institutional capability really almost has to be ahead of the curve in terms of the, and come and lay that groundwork before a device actually lands uh, uh, or is installed uh, in a country. Um, I, I know uh, that's been very helpful um, for me as I think about future travel, you know, communicating with your staff, communicating with other parts of the agency about, okay, well, where are the, you know, the, there are the first wave countries and, and what is uh, helpful in terms of um, the engagement of the United States, mm. where is the agency looking at laying groundwork so that we can um, build on those efforts, hopefully augment those efforts um, uh, to, have a, to have a greater impact to facilitate that, those deployments. And I think for this kind of initiative, a uh, graded approach is very important. We uh, do not have the same requirements for uh, mammography units, for instance, and uh, radiotherapy equipment, of course. So that means that we need to assess, uh, you know, the situation in, in each member state from this priority list you just mentioned, and then to provide the support as needed for them to reach the right level before receiving this uh, uh, equipment. Yeah, very good. Thank you. I want to talk about your career journey and your um, experiences in science, technology, and engineering and math. Your career has spanned multiple fields, um, both technical and administrative. 
um, with protecting really people in the environment as the, as the key theme. Um, you've said that you believe that developing a holistic approach that combines technical matters and public affairs is crucial for finding solutions to complex issues. I think you and I have spoken personally about this too on the sidelines of a few receptions here and there, and I've been so fascinated by it. But I wanted to see if you could just share a little bit more about that perspective, and particularly, you know, how, how your career has, has, has progressed from early stages and what you were focused on into your, your time at ASN and, and now at the agency, and, and how the combination of, of those perspectives has evolved. So that's a very interesting you know, point uh, because um, you can build different you know, professional uh, pathways, let's say. So, uh, from um, my side, so even you know, at ISN, I uh, had three different positions. The first one was uh, in uh, the radiation protection field, so uh, and uh, on medical, you know, um, uh, facilities uh, more specifically. The second one uh, was um, with uh, waste management uh, safety, decommissioning, research reactor safety, fuel cycle facilities, mm -hmm. you know, safety. So, <laughs> what? And the last one, when I was a commissioner, of course, uh, uh, the scope was uh, much broader, but uh, different, with another uh, level of involvement, but of course, uh, uh, covering a very, very wide range of topics, uh, all uh, ISN activities. So what I have learned from this is that you have always uh, benefit from listening uh, to other views. Uh, in particular, you know, I just you know the medical field, uh, regulating the medical field is completely different from you know regulating uh, nuclear power plants. Indeed. But if you want to make uh, the most robust decisions, you need to listen to others' views. In particular, when they are different from yours. So this is, uh, to me, uh, a key point that uh, if you can listen to and uh, include in your you know, decision-making process different views, I'm sure that the decision is more robust. And this is from the technical perspective together with this uh, kind of uh, political dimension, political in the very wide sense, and so policy makers, uh, I would say, uh, that uh, nothing is only on technical matters, so in particular in the nuclear field. We know that uh, stakeholders' uh, involvement is a key uh, factor, transparency, uh, public communications is uh, something very, very important. So having this kind of uh, different uh, dimensions uh, to me, that makes a lot of sense for us to be able to make the most robust uh, decision. And in fact, this is the only or uh, ultimate you know, objective. Now, working at the agency, I would say that there is another dimension, which is uh, geopolitical, you know, uh, and this is another step, you know, uh, in the how many dimensions you need to include when you make a decision or when you work uh, on a daily basis. So technical, this kind of uh, policy making, you know, approach together with geopolitical, I think this is a now a third dimension, you know. Uh, I'm learning, you know, uh, in Vienna. <laughs> No small thing, this geopolitics and no, the way not that really. <laughs> influences decisions. <laughs> well, since that's such an easy topic, why don't we see what we've got here on the uh, on 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 the iPad? Um, and I am going to try and and update this. And unfortunately, I have to I'm, I have to use my glasses. So excuse me, just a second. So while, here's, here's the first question, I think this is a good one. While the IAEA issues recommendations and the NRC enforces rules and requirements, how can the global nuclear market flourish without robust global standards? And what role do you think the IAEA should establish in, uh, or play, excuse me, in establishing these standards? So I think this is, um linked to this uh, core activity I mentioned, uh, how to develop uh, safety standards. Uh, this has been another you know, case for decades now because um, this is part of our, the mandate of the agency. The challenge now is how we can you know, develop safety standards. Do we need more standards or do we need 
to revise some standards. I think this is a first, uh, uh, first of all, a w one of, uh, we need to decide whether we need more standards in a more um, detailed, you know, uh, in more detailed uh, documents, or if we need to update, you know, standard. And for this, this is not only uh, with the secretariat, so the services of the, the agency. This is something that needs to be decided together with member states. Because these standards, they are, you know, developed for member states, only for member states. This is not for uh, our own use. It's, uh, and that means that we need to find some ways to interact with member states so that we can collect uh, your expectations, how we can, you know, uh, develop additional standards or not. And what is very important is that we need to have uh, to succeed in uh, um, reaching a consensus because safety standards are developed based on a consensus approach. That means that if member states do not agree on the same you know, priorities, that's of course something we need to uh, manage and we need to handle so that we can you know, proceed with a common you know, understanding of our priorities. And that's what gives you know, this uh, robustness to safety standards, because they are recognized by all member states. But this is a positive aspect. But yes. on the other side, of course, we need to build this consensus. And uh, with uh, so many member states, sometimes, of course, it's a, it's a challenge. But to me, uh, having this uh, same process, which has proved to be, you know, efficient, uh, including from, uh, for, you know, uh, other um, partners. Mm -hmm. This is something we need to continue now, how to adapt our, process, uh, our ways of working and how to revise or develop new standards, for instance, for SMRs. But for the time being, we have, you know, uh, work on this and uh, after a review of applications, of uh, applicability of uh, safety standards, the conclusions were that we could manage with the existing you know, set of safety standards while developing a few additional guidance documents. So this is something ongoing, and I think that will be uh, in addition to the safety standards. Of course, the Committee on Safety Standards the, um, has been really critical, I think, in, in developing some of these things. And, and yet we also recognize the unique um, uh, twists or approaches that each country has to uh, regulating, to evaluating licenses, um, uh, et cetera, that while there are these high-level standards, there are also going to be some, some regional and country-specific differences. The, you know, what we're seeing, I think, in our collaboration with Canada and, and now with the UK has been, um, uh, you know, the real desire to have that kind of standardized design and for other countries to you know, get in and look at the specific uh, reviews and how they might be able to take credit. Of course, I'm, I'm previewing our technical session on Thursday morning yet again uh, <laughs> uh, on, on this topic about not to minimize the amount of kind of reinventing the wheel. But in a way, that standardized design is on the part of vendors is the other part of that equation. That's why, you know, this uh, NESI initiative has two tracks. So this yes. uh, new initiative launched by the DG in 2022 has two tracks. One on uh, industrial matters, and so with this uh, standardization, you know, uh, objective, and then one of the regulatory uh, matters. And this is on this one that, of course, the Department of Nuclear Safety and Security is uh, involved. With this, uh, what you mentioned, uh, avoiding, you know, duplication, and then maybe, maybe in addition, learning from others, you know, and uh, leveraging uh, lessons learned from other regulators so that we can uh, improve or strengthen the work uh, that can be done together with different, you know, regulators so that we can, you know, move forward in a most, more efficient manner. So that's avoiding duplication while being more efficient and, of course, uh, maintaining the sovereignty of each member state with regard to safety. Yeah, if I think about that, uh, uh, the most tangible result of the uh, NESI, as it's called, uh, the Nuclear Harmonization and Standardization Initiative, I think it's that um, avoiding that duplication and that redundancy, uh, I think, could be 
could be one of the most impactful things. But it, it, is there anything you wanted to? I, I don't want to say that that's the most impactful. I wanted to. Uh, I think it has been uh, a bit challenging, you know, to put together all regulators with different views and different needs. We're a wily of, bunch. <laughs> because, in fact, there are, you know, very uh, a wide range of uh, expectations. Mm -hmm. So, from uh, member states who would like to use SMRs for their uh, domestic, you know, needs, but without any existing, you know, um, regulatory framework. While uh, on the other side, there are, of course, uh, member states with uh, an extensive experience on uh, nuclear uh, regulatory matters. So having all these re regulators and then finding a way to uh, develop this cooperation has been a bit challenging at the very beginning. And I think this is uh, still something we need to uh, continue to work on. Regarding the two tracks, uh, I would like to mention that there are, of course, coordination uh, mechanisms. So that you know what is uh, being uh, done by this uh, industrial track is not completely you know uh, disconnected uh, from what we are doing on the regulatory tracks because at the, some point and uh, not too late <laughs> in the process we should have some uh, well coordinated you know um, well coordinated uh, coordinated mechanisms. There will be a plenary meeting on SE uh, in uh, October <laughs> so this year and that will be a good uh, opportunity to. Uh, present, you know, the progress made over the last uh, two years and then to prepare for the next steps because that will be the very first uh, step uh, after two years, but we are preparing the next steps so that we can, of course, continue developing this cooperation on SMRs. Thank you. I've got another question here. Uh, I, think it's, I think this is a good one. The US, or, the US NRC places a priority on resident inspectors. Not just the NRC, by the way, but other countries do too. I was in, in Spain a couple of weeks ago and got to meet their resident inspectors. However, many other nuclear um, regulators implement their mission without regular on-site safety inspections. So how are they different and successful in implementing their mission? Mm. Does the agency have a view on this? Is there, uh, you know, talking about kind of standardization and guidance and mm. capacity building and so forth. I'd love to get your thoughts. Yes. So I remember this topic when I was, you know, in France and the discussions with the U.S. in addition. Yes. In France, you know, we do not have any resident inspectors. But now, having a, um, taking a step back, I think, I think we need to, f to think a bit, you know, um, in a more holistic manner. What I mean is, so it's not only resident inspectors or not, it's how this is you know implemented implemented together with the other you know provisions for inspection. So I would say that as long as it uh, makes sense, you know, and uh, because of uh, the specific need of a member state. So first of all, there is uh, of course no uh, objections uh, at the level of um, the agency uh, safety standards. Huh? It's more about uh, how each member state uh, implements the what it uh, considers as the most appropriate ways for inspection could be not only um, resident inspectors, but uh, how often you rotate, you know, your inspectors responsible for a given uh, site. Even if uh, there are not resident inspectors, if you have for 10 years the same, you know, team of inspectors inspecting a same, uh, the same facility, you can have something, you know, not as a resident inspector, but you may have some practices, you know, that uh, this kind of uh, new uh, or fresh eyes, you know, approach that works uh, for a while, but not uh, for 10 uh, years. So I think it's more how each regulator, you know, does manage uh, its capacity to conduct inspections to keep this uh, objectivity and these fresh eyes. So, Again, that applies to resident inspectors and to inspectors in uh, general. And considering the national scheme for inspections, I think, uh, to me, that's very important. And you cannot apply the same you know, organization uh, to the US and uh, to another you know, member states with, a, uh, let's say, one uh, nuclear power plant, of course. So that's uh, completely different. Thank you. That's fascinating. I love it. I'm going to finish up, I think, with a, um, I think an interesting but slightly product 
provocative uh, question for maybe for both of us. And it's with respect to the war in Ukraine, would a new multinational treaty, similar to say the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, that prohibits military attacks on or in or from nuclear power plants by signatories help prevent or limit the types of issues we're seeing now in Ukraine. We've seen the Director General, he has the, the seven principles and the five pillars in a way that kind of set those ethical and policy norms for the safe operation of, of a nuclear power plant in a conflict zone. But would a, a more formal mechanism like a standalone treaty um, contribute to that overall norm setting, mm. do you think? So this is a question we uh, have uh, been receiving now for, you know, since the very beginning of the war. So the question is whether with a legally binding instrument, let's say, mm -hmm. what we are experiencing at Zaporizhia would have been avoided or not. We've seen a lot of other norms and, and international yes. treaties violated in Ukraine exactly. as well. Uh, as in addition, there is already a, a resolution uh, adopted by the board of uh, governors of the agency yes. that uh, states that uh, any military activities should uh, you know, be avoided or prevented uh, at a nuclear power uh, plant. So there, is already some, uh, there are already some provisions on this. Uh, of course, transcending the, the international uh, framework, uh, considering this kind of uh, very uh, unprecedented you know, uh, situations, could bring some value, added value. Would it be enough to avoid this kind of situation? That it's another story, I think, you know, because in Ukraine there are other uh, treaties, uh, international uh, law, uh, international legal provisions yes. that have been a breach, huh? uh, for sure. So it's how we can manage. For From this side, I would say that um, so at the agency, our top priority is to prevent an accident, a nuclear accident. So I know this is a very, uh, let's say, restrictive, but this is really our top priority. Uh, that's why we are, you know, deploying so many, you know, uh, rotations in Ukraine. We are delivering uh, equipment for nuclear safety and security. This legal aspect, I think, at some point will have to be, you know, addressed. Is it today the right moment? That I don't know, but I know that there are, you know, some uh, uh, legal uh, officers uh, working on it, or at, as, at least, you know, reflecting on what could have been done for this. Yeah. Oh, thank you uh, for that perspective. It is a it, it is a little bit of a conundrum, and there are multi multiple sides of this, and. And sometimes I, it can be useful to have the international legal norms or the ethical norms in place, even if it, they're not fully effective in preventing yeah. uh, a tragedy like this. And I know that's part of the discussion as well. Some people, you know, consider that that could be, you know, uh, discussed further once the war is over. And that's probably very difficult to address this topic now uh, as it is. Thank you. We've thank you. reached the end of our time. I want to thank you very, very much. Uh, it, it is, it's a great pleasure to have you here at the RIC. You said this is your first RIC, <laughs> so uh, I think a uh, 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 welcome. And uh, I'm, I'm so pleased you're here, and uh, I, I appreciate the, very much the conversation. And it's a, it's a great privilege and honor uh, for me and the rest of the NRC to participate and support and um, occasionally cajole <laughs> um, uh, the agency and all uh, of you do. I just wanted to ask you if you've got any final thoughts you'd like to share. So, any final, final words of wisdom for us at your first at your first. Thank trick? you for this conversation. I think it uh, has covered a wide range of topics. So from uh, my yes. personal experience, so yes. it was, it's always you know, a pleasure to have this kind of uh, opportunity to interact with uh, such a wide audience and very uh, you know, uh, interesting questions. So thank you so much to all of you. Thank you to you, of thank course, you. Uh, Chris, for this. My pleasure. Thank you.